All righty, class. Uh, back again on chapter on deviance. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, you may listen. I don't know if you'll see this, but as it's recording for me, it looks like a helicopter whirl up here, making a shadow. Uh, that's a fan running. I need the fan. Got my air off because it's been so nice, cool weather here in uh, the fall. We're moving into the early fall, um, 2020. I have to, I learned years ago from doing other uh, classes and doing uh, videos. You don't want to be too specific because, you know, I'll be, I'll be using these, these are new videos. So I'll be using these uh, for future courses next semester actually so if i can catch myself in trouble here if i start talking about dates and start talking about the weather this kind of thing because it might be in the dead of winter and i'm talking about summertime so I, i've learned learned I, and i have to watch my p, p and q's uh when i'm doing videos and keep them quite generic uh throw the students throw the students off uh, but anyway, we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, you guys should have read, uh, the chapter on deviance. And, uh, I'm not going to get down into the weeds with all the nuances of the theories, uh, that you have. What I'm going to do is just give you some of my generalized thoughts on each of these theories well, on three of them actually on labeling theory uh, and also on the uh, 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 strain theory uh, structural strain theory we call it and also um, association differential association theory so I want to touch base with those three general uh, perspectives give you a little bit of background and uh, and especially talk a little bit about how these theories may affect poly actual government policy uh, a lot of times students will say well you know these uh these theories are, are interesting interesting uh, in 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 the uh, you know in the rarefied air of theory uh, but what what application did it have? Well, actually, a uh, good many of the sociological uh, theories have had an impact on actually government policy, and uh, th these th these th three theories actually have played a, a big part in government policies towards uh, correcting deviant behavior, for example. Uh, but uh, I want to start out by uh, talking a little bit about. The nature of deviance in, in sociological theory, and uh, I always stress that uh, I really appreciate students of sociology should appreciate the the, the uh, work on deviance in human societies. Why is that? Why you know we th we think of deviance as negative, uh, but it, it also pay, plays po a positive role in society. And that's something we're not used to thinking about, right? Uh, so first of all, the deviance, first of all, deviance would not exist or does not exist unless there's a, there is an alternate, uh, alternate, uh, norm governing behavior. So if you don't have a norm that governs how people should behave and act, uh, then it's hard, then you, it's hard for you to say what is normal and what is deviant. Without the norm, you don't know what's deviant. Once a norm is set, and again, the, the, the written and unwritten, unwritten rules of human behavior, right? That were so those social expectations that we're expected to uh, adhere to. Uh, if we if uh, if we didn't have deviance, then we human beings would be like yes people, right? We would we would agree with everything. So in, in that sense, then deviant behavior um, um, shows us that human beings, after all, 
have a degree of freedom. And that's one of the major reasons because of deviant behavior, because we don't always, and in many situations don't, adhere to the social expectations of the various groups that we belong to. Uh, then that makes us, uh, to a degree, not 100% predictable. So that's why we use uh, probability statistics in sociology, is because we cannot predict. Again, you, would have, you should have had this in your intro to social class. Uh, we can't predict 100% what our individual is going to do. Uh, that said, using probability st statistics, we can... Uh, get close, we can say there's a 98% chance that if a person is uh, if a kid growing up in a community that's you know, uh, has a lot of gang gangs, a lot of poverty, etc., grind crime, uh, that, that in there's a 98% chance they will also join a gang at some point. Uh, yeah, that that's that's good numbers. I mean, that's a good prediction. Probably it's probably less than that anyway. Uh, but uh, we can't predict 100%. And there's myriads of cases, right, that kids grow up in the most dire situation and under conditions that you would think that would, uh, in communities, would lead them to join gangs and, and at some point commit, uh, commit crime. But when that, that's not true. In some, you know, many cases where, you know, young kids grow up in certain communities and they become highly successful in life. Uh, that has to do with many variables. And uh, so human beings are not predictable in that sense. That's a positive outcome of the reality of deviant behavior. Again, let's go back to the sociological uh, definition. Uh, now, a lot of times, we, times when we think of deviance, we think of criminal behavior. Well, that's one form of deviance. Sociology goes, encompasses uh uh, criminal behavior, but we go beyond that. And uh, so that any, in within any group context, and as we know, all groups will form certain norms, right? For example, subcultures will have their own norms of what is right and what is wrong behaviors. So when we deviate from the group's expectations, even if it was a illegitimate uh, or a, a subculture that was dealing, dealing in uh, illegal uh, activities, right? A deviant subculture. Uh, even if we were, so if, even if we're studying that particular group, we're going to want to know uh, what are the norms of this group and what happens to folks when they, when they don't follow the norms, right? When they break the norms, when they become deviant within that group context, right? So deviance, uh, in a sense, is a positive in that it shows that we human beings have, have a bit of freedom within social, uh, social structure of society, that we, there, we are free to say no. And it can be a, both a negative and a positive. Uh, and we're used to thinking of deviance in a negative sense. So when we think of, for example, I'll just give one, one example, a great example. Uh, but the uh, civil rights movement. So Dr. King and his, uh, his followers and other leaders within the movement, uh, though, though today they're seen as heroes of the society, uh, you know, they're praised. We have the MLK Day. But back during this, and I remember this growing up in that time period that uh, uh, Dr. King and his leaders, they were seen as criminals uh, when they were marching, when they were fighting for their civil rights. Uh, they were thrown in jail many times. And um, the most famous of which is um, Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail, his letter from Birmingham jail. and. Uh, so at the time, they were seen as highly deviant criminals, right? But because that social movement was going against the grain of the norms of society at the time, over time, because of the successes of getting rid of segregation, getting rid of the Jim Crow laws, uh, 
we now see that it was a positive deviance, right? Um, and there's many other examples of a positive form of uh, deviance, not deviance, but uh, 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 how to remedy deviance. There's many, there's negative ways of doing that, but it's also very positive ways of, of uh, trying to minimize deviant behavior. So, for example, uh, the college degree itself is a positive uh, formal form of, uh, of uh, uh, keeping deviance at, 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 a bay, at bay or at, you know, at a minimum. Uh, so students strive to get uh, to get their college degrees, and, and in doing so, they're conforming their behaviors to what's expected of them in the class. So the studying, coming to class when you don't feel like it, reading boring books from your perspective, uh, you know. And uh, but you do. Why do you do it? Well, you're doing it because you're conforming your behavior to all these expectations. So in the end. Uh, you're awarded this this uh, this what we what what is defined as uh, your pathway into the middle class is getting that college credential. In order to get that college degree, you've got as you know you've got to conform your behaviors to to the norms of the university in order to get it. And uh, but along that path of getting to that positive uh, reward. It's not a negative reward, right? You know that old notion that we get more we get more with uh, honey than we do with vinegar. It's the same thing here. So, for example, a positive socialization over time is the best way to get people to uh, follow the norms of a group. Is through positive, not negative. Of course, negative can work too if it, if needed. But the best the best formula. Think about when you're working with your kids at home. If you have kids, is the best social, the best remedy to deviant behavior is positive socialization, and uh, that tends to be the most long-lasting. Uh, people tend to resist when they're being forced to conform. Uh, so there's both negative types of uh, deviants, but also positive forms as well. And again, uh, uh, deviants. Is that which makes us human after all? That ability to say no. And that's a, that's a, from a symbolic interactionist perspective, especially. That's that degree of individual freedom that we do have in society. Even though we're pressured from all sides to conform every day and we go along 99% of the time. But even small forms of deviant behavior. So we, you know, in terms of, and it depends again on the group context. So in the context of the of a classroom, there's forms of deviant behavior because of certain norms. Norms like coming to class on time, uh, not talking with others when the professor is is lecturing, or when there's a film in the class, or when other students are presenting. The class you're supposed to be paying attention to them and giving them deference. Uh, so when kids are talking and giggling, that's classroom disruption, right? You can receive sanctions for, for doing so. Um, so in that sense, though, and then if you think of all the other groups we belong to, you know, if you're at home and you're, you should, let's say one of your rules in the family, excuse me, is that, you know, after supper, the husband's going to wash the dishes. Well, as we know, that maybe that doesn't always happen that way. And so even within the family context, we deviate from what's expected of it. So in that sense, we're all deviants. We're all deviant. We, we deviate uh, probably on a daily basis from some norm that we're supposed to be adhering to. You should be studying for next week's exam, for example. You haven't studied a lick yet. Well, that's deviant behavior from the context of the classroom uh, and in terms of the severity of the sanctions that will come into play once we deviate that varies from one group to the next what might be a moray this is coming from intro course more is those very mores are those very 
important social norms within any group that uh, uh, is based on the survival of the group. Uh, and then you have many folkway type norms that are sort of minor. You know, your etiquette at the dinner table, for example. Uh, so uh, we're constantly both conforming and, and deviating. And uh, sometimes it's minor deviations. Uh, the other times, like if you're in class and going back to the class context, uh, if you're if you're uh, uh, plagiarizing your papers, that's a ma that's a more in the classroom context, and you could be your sanction could be uh, uh, could be uh, ex expulsion from the university for a year, for example. Uh, and others, like maybe coming late to class, you might lose a few points or this kind of thing. So in the end, it's sort of a saving grace deviant behavior. It really shows that we're human after all. We're not robots. Uh, that said then, um, the chapter goes in looking at uh, uh, several theories of deviance. And uh, all, of them, all of them have something to say and all of them have a slice of reality to them, right? Uh, no one theory tells us everything, but when we study them all together as students of sociology, we get a much broader picture of, of, of the uh, what caused the causations of deviance. And in this chapter, we look at uh, you're looking you're looking at labeling theory, which is uh, uh, born out of uh, 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 it's symbolic interactionist theory. Then you have the structural strain theory of deviance. And structural strain is born out of the structural functionalist uh, paradigm. And then you have the uh, uh, differential association, uh, which is, it's not some, it's, it's, it's I, I would say that, yeah, it is also uh, influenced heavily by structural functionalism in that it's a socialization theory. Uh, so, so we have these these three major paradigms through which these various theoretical models have uh, have appeared and uh, utilized. Um, each one of them tell us something about uh, the nature of deviance, and it's good to know all three. Uh, but none alone tells us everything. Um, another thing to look at with these three theories is they all three of them have policy implications. All three of them have been influential in actual government policy making towards trying to um, uh, amend a deviant behavior. Each of these three theories have have a culprit, and what you will see with the, all three of these theories is that not none of them blame the individual. So you'll notice that or you should notice as you study them, that they don't blame the individual for their demon behavior. Something's going wrong in society. There's something in the patterns of the structures of society or, or the uh, cultural labels in society that bring about uh, deviant uh, behavior. So when you look at um, the, uh, when we look at uh, labeling theory, and when I think of labeling theory, I think about this, the symbolic interactionist theorist uh, uh, Becker, right? If you if you read, you'll you read his work there. And Becker uh, had a big influence on the development of this uh, theorist as a theory as a symbolic interactionist, and um, he felt that uh, uh, he 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 saw that that uh, deviant was a relative term. And it's highly constructed, socially constructed, and uh, based on definitions. And uh, but uh, I, what I find uh, very interesting about the labeling theory, and what I like about the labeling theory, is of the of the three theories, it 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 looks at the it looks at the uh, production of deviant behavior in society by looking upwards. That is, it looks up towards the power power structure of society. There's those people 
empower and, and in that sense it's got a bit of critical theory to it to it as well uh that it's the people in power and their defining of what is deviant what is not uh, that people will fall within the categories of being deviant or not. That is, devious is not again. Uh, it's not. It's not something that's inherent to the individual self. It's it's through the society's definitions of what behaviors are deviant and what is not. And we, you know, we can all we can look back in history and see that, uh, for example. The turn of the 20th century uh, in the United States, if women were caught smoking in public, they were put in jail for that. That was seen as deviant behavior and actually criminal behavior for a woman to be walking down the street and smoking in public. Uh, that was against the law. Again, and that now, you know, after that, you know, you come a long way, baby. Remember, I don't know if you guys aren't old enough. Probably some, maybe a couple of you are. That old commercial in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, about, um, uh, you've come a long way, that cigarette slogan. You've come, uh, you've come a long way, baby. And, uh, uh basically is looking at, uh, the feminist movement, success as a feminist movement was being articulated with uh, smoking cigarettes. Uh, and of course, uh, as it says in the, that, that great uh, video of uh, 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 Still Killing Us Softly, that documentary, uh, that uh, women that smoke like men die like men. And, uh, but there, there again, uh, society's definitions of what is deviant and what is not is the culprit. Uh, and there's been many, uh, a long history of various human behaviors that were labeled as deviant, uh, or, or even in the, uh, uh, psychological manuals of uh, definitions of insanity and the mental illness. Uh, you know, the furthest back we got would be with the, uh, you know, it was seen as a mental illness for slaves to run away from, from their masters. So runaway slaves were seen as mentally ill for doing so and, uh, could be punished in that way. And, uh, and then on down, I mean, there's just many, many different uh, mental health labels that are socially constructed. Um, but again, the, the the gist is is that uh, uh, as you're reading the chapter, uh, that when a person is caught doing something that's not correct, it might be deviant. They've been noticed by others. So at first, it starts off as being noticed by others. Someone's done something. Someone's been cheating on a test and it's noticed by the professor. Uh, well, that's just, it's a process of, of being labeled as deviant. First of all, that's, that's, first is to be caught doing something or to be seen. And once a person is seen, then they tend to stand out as a special person. Uh, now the professor, in this situation, a professor could, uh, Tell the person, hey, I noticed that you were cheating on an exam. Okay. Notice you're looking on the, the student next to you what you were looking at her, uh, her answers. I can see her eyes anyway, going back and forth. Stop doing that. I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you off at this time. I'm not going to pull the test and give you an F. I'm going to, I'm just telling you not. So you're giving that person a warning. Well, in that situation, then that person's not really that labeled as DV at that point. But if the professor jerks the test away and says, uh, I'm giving you an F on the test, uh, you know, you were cheating on the exam with your iPhone or whatever, uh, and, uh, I'm going to write you up and turn you into the university about your, your, your plagiarism or your cheating on exams. Now you're headed towards being labeled as deviant, right? So a person goes through a process. So if a young man breaks into a liquor store and steals 
of money and then he gets caught by the police and then they throw the book at him a lot of times it has to do with social class as well uh uh then you get a, a court appointed lawyer and they want you to plead guilty because they don't have time to argue you a long case so let's just take the lesser of the of the uh sentence and so you you plead guilty but you get uh let's say you get six months in jail anyway or confinement in uh juvenile detention or whatever then 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 you you're you've been labeled the deviant that deviant designation is being uh cheat or being labeled as a, a child molester being chitler or being labeled as uh, breaking and entering, uh, a theft, and that sticks, and you even maybe end up in jail for it. Then, that, then you're considered deviant. Uh, one aspect of this is that then, then society labels you, and that can follow you around for the rest of your life sometimes, and that affect whether you're going to ever have any success in finding a job or uh, this kind of thing. So, labeling theory then the culprit terms of deviance is uh, society's labels of what is deviant what is not and once you've gone down the process of being labeled deviant for some certain act then there tends to be and you'll read this in the chapter it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy over time or the, let's say the and these th three theories tend to look at juvenile delinquency you may have noticed that when you read it uh but the young person uh, uh, internalizes that label and, and, and begins to see themselves as deviant, you know. And uh, as soon as I get out of this jail, and um, I'm going to go right back to doing what I was doing before, maybe even worse. So they call it secondary deviance. Uh, and secondary deviance has to do with the self-fulfilling prophecy, as you'll read in the, the book. But the culprit is society, so you can write this in your notes. Uh, the culprit of deviance for labeling theory is society's definitions. So, for a uh, for a uh, 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 labeling theorist, one way that society can uh, make conditions in society better is to change the definitions of deviance. One way we can save putting a lot of people in jail and having to spend a lot of money, for example, why don't we just legalize uh, marijuana, the use of recreational marijuana? And uh, that's going to then, that's no longer going to be seen as a crime. And when people get caught, but they're not going to be bothered with it, right? So like in Portugal, for example, uh, they don't have any laws against illegal drugs whatsoever. That's up to an individual if they want to ruin their lives or, you know, whatever they want to do. But that's seen as a private matter. And so they're not going to put you in jail for having cocaine in your pocket. Uh, Michael Moore did a movie. Uh, uh, where to invade next? I think it's the name of it. He goes to these different societies and looks at these, some of these issues. And I mean, it's kind of students are shocked when they get maybe we'll watch that. Uh, we're going to be watching some films here coming up. Uh, we're going to slow down a little bit. And uh, so I may, I'll see if I can get that film off of this site that I go to for educational movies. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that movie extremely so. Uh, so I'll, I'll check that. So now the next one is uh, differential association theory. I'm going to move along a little quicker here. Differential association, no, I'm sorry, not differential association. That's the third one. Uh, structural strain theory. Structural strain theory out of functionalist theory is based on the notion of the lack, the lack of opportunities in society. That there's a structural strain where certain groups of people do not have access to a legitimate route to success in life. And uh, so that if people are put at a disadvantage, this has to do with, with this has to do with how far people are away from legitimately realizing uh, success in society. And uh, so if you grow, if you're a kid growing up in the uh, in the impoverished community where there's a lot of gangs uh, let's say there's a lot of selling of drugs and this kind of thing. And uh, nobody in your family has ever been to, to university or college. 
So you don't have that cultural capital that might uh, motivate you uh, to go on to college or finish high school. But you're looking around as a kid in the community, and you're seeing that a lot of and these other these other uh, friends here, these older guys, they they got a lot of money, nice clothes. No, where? How does that happen? And uh, let's say you, you're in, you're asked to join a gang. Uh, you may say so the theory doesn't say 100% that an individual is going to do this, but it says that it makes it much more possible that a young person will take a deviant path. They'll go off the legitimate path and then get involved in illegitimate means to the same, uh, to achieve the same goals that we all have in our society. So we think about the material success that we all want and, you know, to have a comfortable lifestyle, to, the, uh, the American dream of having owning your own home, a couple of cars, buying new clothes, the good life of we, you know, the upper middle class lifestyle. Or, uh, so that even those who are selling drugs, uh, running a drug ring, they want the same thing. They're wanting uh, the goals of the society. As, as legitimate, they don't. They're not. They're not uh, like some groups. They're not going against the goals of the society. They're they're not turning away from society in that sense. They want the same things that other people are. You know, other leg- people that are getting things through a good life through legitimate means. Uh, but they find that there's this other route I can do much easier. I'm never going to go to college. I did, I did, did terrible in high school. I got, I don't have the money, whatever. It's a million miles away. For some people, going to college is, is like having, having to go to Mars. But I can take this route here and I can get involved in this group right here and I can make my money now. And, uh, I can buy the things, all the things that I, I want. A new car, nice clothes, this kind of thing. And, uh, so, the differential association, I keep saying that, uh, the structural strain theory is based on the structure of opportunities and, the, and that certain groups of people have lacked structural opportunities to get ahead in society. So for the structural, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the structural strain theorist, uh, what is the uh, culprit for causing deviant behavior? Right in your notes, it's the lack of, it's the lack of, uh, having opportunities, right? It's the lack of opportunities in society. So what is then the, the government policy? The government policies for, uh, labeling theory, theory is to get rid of labels, to, uh, to, to begin to turn some labels away so that people aren't going to be defined as deviant, right? Like smoking marijuana, this kind of thing. Uh, the culprit for structural strain theory is the opportunities of society have been, have collapsed for some certain groups. So what can we do? So then what is the uh, social policy implications? Well, uh, in that situation, it is the government policies towards offering more opportunities for people. They're giving out grants, uh, uh, business, uh, small business loans, this kind of thing, giving grants for students who are uh, in, under in poverty don't have the income they can they can have grants to go to colleges we see it you know they're, they're based on this theory to try to make things better for people but the culprit again is the, the lack of, stru- of the structural opportunities of the society and then in the last theory I'm trying to move along to save us a little time uh, the last theory that you're going to be studying there is that differential association theory. <clears throat> differential association uh, in 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 the uh, everyday vernacular, we're talking about uh, who you hang out with. So it's the people. It's, again, none of these are pointing towards the the inner personality psyche of the individual. Is not the issue. The issue is the this wider society. Things going on in the wider society. So for uh, uh, differential association theory, the culprit, what is the culprit? The culprit is the culture in which that person is immersed. So it's the subculture that that person's in that's deviant. It's not the individual that's deviant. 
This is also a socialization theory. So a young person that's socialized into the values and the norms and skill set, let's say, of a pickpocket ring in a poor community. Uh, what's the culprit? The culprit is the, the let's say the young person that's uh, the juvenile that's being socialized into that subculture. They're being normally socialized. So their socialized pattern into how to steal things out of stores. That's not that's not a deviant thing. That that's normal. That kid's not psychologically damaged. That's that uh, he's not men or he or she's not mentally ill. She's just like you and I are. Of course, you know we all have our problems, but uh, but uh, you know they're they're normal. They're being normally socialized into a deviant subculture. So the culprit for the Differential association theory it, uh, is a subculture. Deviant subcultures, who you're hanging out with, right? All parents worry about those peer groups, especially when kids get into high school. Who you're hanging out with can be a problem, right? If they're, especially if they're seen as troublemakers, labeling theory, right? And uh, so that's the, the culprit's the deviant subculture, not the individual. So uh, the uh, the policy implications quite clearly uh, for uh, differential association theories to take the person, the young person, out of the deviant subculture and place them in into, into a model uh, legitimized type family situation where they can be re-socialized into more legitimate forms of behaviors, right? So this is really the basis, the governmental basis or policy, policy making for the notion, if you've heard of them, of the halfway homes, the juvenile detention homes. Uh, when I was in Canada, my wife worked at a, a, a juvenile delinquent, delinquent homes. They were home for young offenders, it was called. And, uh, they're all kind of based on the same type of, uh, uh, type of therapeutic model of, of giving, placing them in a, in a quote unquote structured uh, middle class lifestyle and re them into following the norms of behaviors they need to, to strive towards a more legitimate form of lifestyle, if you will, and choices. And that's done with, through a token, token system. And the token system is when when the kids are doing the right behaviors and right things during the month, maybe at the end of the month, the government, in my wife's case, the province of uh, Ontario, would give each kid, a, a, a pretty, especially for Canadians. We, you know, we talk about social welfare, and America's got no nothing compared to the Canadian welfare system. I'm going to go off just a little bit here. I don't want to go off too far, though. I don't have time, but I'll talk about this in some other channels. I live in Canada, so I can give you some more, some things that are coming up. I'll go into a little bit into the Canadian system, but just, just to know that, uh, in, for example, in the, in the, uh, halfway homes, juvenile delinquency, uh, homes there where my wife worked, uh, at the end of the month, the kids got good money, man. The government gave them plenty of money, and at the end of each month, they would take them out on the buses. And go to the malls and they would, uh, uh, they would go shopping and they would buy, you know, really expensive tennis shoes, um, you know, uh, boom boxes, records, uh, you name it, clothing, uh, what, what was, but what was in the end ironic about it was that while they were at the uh, mall, uh, some of their friends have already been notified that they would be coming to a certain mall. And uh, this was in Toronto, big city. And, uh, uh, they would meet their buddies there and they would be sneaking concubine into the, back into the house. So that late at night, they would go through the rooms and they would find six packs of beer in there, uh, all kinds of stuff that they had gotten cigarettes, you know, you know, kids will be kids. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, just to, just to sum, sum, sum up now, cause we need to end. Uh, 
So for labeling theory, the culprit is society's definitions and the uh, social policies using the labeling theory perspective is to change or to rid the society of certain definitions. Change the definitions so that uh, that's no longer seen as deviant behavior. So you change the definition of female smoking cigarettes in public. By getting rid of that, then that decriminalizes their behavior and uh, you know, saves society, society money in the end. Uh, in Portugal, just getting rid of all the drug labels of uh, whatever drug you want to use, and uh, that saves them a lot of money in terms of housing prisoners for drugs, and uh, you know, whether you agree with it or not. Um, but uh, they tend to have a pretty good outcome anyway. Uh, and then uh, with the uh, structural strain in the culprit is the lack of, of uh, structural of opportunities in society. So the uh, policy there is to present more, uh, give, give more opportunities to people. That'll help cut down on the deviant behavior. It's a structural theory. Then differential association, which is a socialization theory, who you hang out with and learn from, uh, the culprit is the deviant subculture. And then the implications and the policies there can be uh, putting, taking the young person out of the deviant subculture, placing them in a quote unquote normal middle class environment, cultural environment, and re socializing them into more legitimate forms of, uh, of uh, norms and behaviors. And uh, so, uh, so go ahead and study those. And there's a lot more nuance into some of these in, in the chapter. And go ahead and study those. And I hope this has been helpful to some extent. And uh, I'll talk to you next time. Alrighty. See you later.